All right, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. Um, my name is Troy Daniels. I'm actually the trainer here at Simplify Power. Uh, today, we're going to be doing Battery Chemistry 101. It's our kind of introductory course. I've given it uh, plenty of time. It's a recurring webinar. Um, just kind of going over product overview, some basic installation stuff, and, and even some sales stuff. Um, you'll notice that the Q&A is live. So if you do have a question, you can actually type it directly into the Q&A. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to get around all those questions at the end, uh, time permitting. Okay, a few housekeeping items. Um, just FYI, you know, with, with everything going on in the world right now, we're, we're probably not going to be re-engaging in in-person trainings for, for some time. So just keep an eye on our webinar page, and, and we got more popping up. Probably by the end of the week, we'll probably have another, I think, five up on the website uh, that are pretty varied and, and new trainings that I've never given. So. Um, some exciting stuff there. Um, if you are a solar installer looking to get onto our installer qualification program, not a requirement to install our batteries, just more of an added benefit, um, you know, contact me afterwards or just take a look on our website for the application. Uh, we're trying to get more and more people to apply for that. Okay, um, and last but not least, if you need NAPSEP credits for this training, uh, you can see training at simplifiedpower.com right there at the bottom. Um, please email me and let me know that you are looking for uh, NAPSAP credits. So um, just shoot, shoot over an email. We send a follow-up at the end with all the slides and everything, so you can always respond to that email as well. All right, let's hop right in. Okay, a little bit about Simplify Power as a company. Uh, 2010 started actually as OES Energy. Um, that's actually uh, the original name of the company. Um, and from there we moved, you know, we did a lot of military, emergency response, various things like that, um, and really started to expand our product line in 2013, 2014. Um, and actually in 2015, 2016, we relaunched as Simplify Power. Since then, we've been ramping up production. Uh, continue to kind of change our products, offerings, um, and really are, are expanding our manufacturing. So what do we do here? We do safe, proven, and simple technology. Safe as it's non-toxic, cobalt-free lithium chemistry, UL certified, um, proven. We've got over 100 megawatt hours installed worldwide, uh, deployed in over 40 countries, and even validated by the U.S. Army and Marine Corps. And simple, no cooling, no ventilation, no thermal monitoring, no fire suppression, and no maintenance. So again, 100 plus megawatt hours. This is probably already out of date. Uh, this slide needs to be updated a lot, but 100 plus megawatt hours since 2010. You can kind of see a, a little overview here of where, where we typically work. And I won't bore you too much with this, but just tons of different applications, everything from commercial, industrial, residential, emergency, uh, off-grid, microgrid. Um, really, we, we try to fit a product into um, almost every market that we can. Okay, let's talk about battery chemistry. So I see a lot of questions coming in, everyone. Um, feel free to type them in whenever you have them. <laughs> I have a funny feeling we'll, we'll probably answer. I see a few questions that I already know we'll answer as we go through the presentation. Okay, battery chemistry. So <clears throat> oftentimes when you think about lithium, <clears throat> excuse me, lithium ion, you know, there's a stigma around it that's related to fires and thermal runaway. Um, and really the, the basis of that is cobalt-based lithium batteries. So you can see here, lithium iron phosphate is a non-cobalt-based battery. That's what we use. Has no chance of thermal runaway, unlike the others. It's actually non-toxic, um, landfill safe, though I would say we should be looking over recycling always, um, ventilation requirements, none, um, cooling requirements, none, and we don't even need extra um, ancillary safety monitoring equipment. So because of that, it's definitely a lot safer, uh, and it's actually able to withstand some high temperatures. So once we've picked our chemistry, we still need to pick our form factor that houses this chemistry. These are some of the big ones, uh, cylindrical, pouch, and prismatic. I've worked with all three of these as far as manufacturing goes. 
prismatic tends to be a bit large, bulky, um, hard to maneuver, and even more costly oftentimes. So if you're buying a battery, a lithium battery that has a prismatic base, sometimes it can be more expensive. The pouch cell, um, this, this one's really common in your laptops, your, your cell phones, things like that. Um, great, works really great in those kind of devices. I don't really like them when it comes to larger scale and, and even you know anything over a kilowatt, I'd consider um, a, probably a little too large when using pouch cells. Um, they tend to have a lot of issues when you're, when you're stacking a lot of them together and even can swell um, and even break. Cylindrical cell, I mean, think AA battery. That's a cylindrical form factor. Um, this is uh, really what we found to be the best form factor, um, built-in short circuit protection and longest lifespan as well as durability. So again, I kind of gave it away already, but simplify batteries, lithium iron phosphate chemistry with a cylindrical form factor. Okay. So this is actually, you know, I keep forgetting to update this slide before the presentation, but this has actually changed. Uh, we no longer are doing different warranties. Every single warranty now, no matter what your depth of discharge is, is 10 years unlimited cycles. So that is the official new warranty, um, unlimited cycles and a 10 year period. That obviously means that whatever comes first. So within that 10 year period that you can use uh, as much of the battery cycling as you want. End of life, very common if you look into warranties, um, you know, various warranties you'll see end of life called out. Basically what end of life means is what is the battery's capacity expected to be at the end of its warranty period? So we actually say EOL is 80%. Uh, I definitely encourage you to look around some other manufacturers. You'll find that this tends to be a lot lower than 80%. And that's just saying it's the minimum that you would expect to see at that 10 year mark but it is very likely that you would have a lot more uh, available capacity still. Okay, temperature ranges. Operating temperature is not so important. I try not to worry too much about operating temperature. Um, this means discharge or um, just in a standby situation. Uh, it is negative four degrees Fahrenheit to 140. Now charging temperature, most batteries do charge, so it's a little bit more important. Um, charging temperature, 32 degrees Fahrenheit to 120, or zero degrees Celsius to 49 degrees C. However, on the top end of things, <clears throat> this really allows us to not need coolant, HVAC systems, or even ventilation uh, when using these batteries. Each of our battery comes with an internal BMS, uh, battery management system. This is internal currently. Uh, we don't offer the external just yet. Um, so this is just handling its own battery. Doesn't mean you can't parallel a bunch of batteries. They just don't need to be connected as far as the BMS goes. Its main function is kind of a last ditch effort protection, whether that's over current protection, cell balancing, or charge and discharge protection. Not to be relied upon, just FYI, you still need to program your system. If you don't do that, uh, the BMS might be overworked on these type of protections and eventually could fail. So. While it does provide protection, uh, it is important to still program the system, which we'll, we'll go into later. Um, and cell balancing, which is really, you know, all lithium batteries require this. Uh, we actually have passive cell balancing, bleeding off resistance on the top end to balance out the cell packs. Okay, let's talk a little bit about C over two. And really what we're talking about here is not only the way that we rate the batteries, so when you see a 75 amp hour battery from us, it was rated at C over two. But this is also the available power when we're talking about continuous power of a battery. So all of our batteries are rated at C over two. For those that don't know, C rate is just a measure of the rate at which a battery is discharged relative to its maximum capacity. So C over two basically meaning that we can charge or discharge this battery in a two hour window. Uh, with a continuous charge. This can be super helpful when it comes to charging more than anything. Uh, I think as far as like solar goes, things like that, on a residential scale, you're probably not discharging at C over two on a residential scale, but having the ability to charge a battery, especially when it comes to a solar array, maybe you have limited sun hours, 
uh, can be really helpful to be able to hit it with that, that fast charge. Um, discharge wise though, you can definitely cover some pretty big supply demand loads with a relatively small battery bank. Okay, our batteries are both scalable and expandable. So as far as scalability goes, um, we really have no limit to how many of these batteries you can put in parallel. Our standard model batteries, which we'll go into here in a second, they are parallel connections only, meaning if you have 224 volts, you don't want to make a 48 volt out of that. You want to buy the 48 volt and parallel those. But again, as far as scalability goes on these batteries, uh, there really isn't much of a limit. You can see here on the left, this project, 88 batteries in parallel, 300 kilowatt hours. Expansion, this is something I don't see a lot or really at all with other companies. We actually allow for the installer to go back after the uh, battery's already installed and you can always add new batteries to old batteries. Uh, there's definitely like a three year limit on that, I believe is the newest update. Um, so you don't wanna do it too far out or else you might see some issues, but um, you can expand on the battery bank, which can be super helpful when you're designing a system or if loads grow or power demands grow. And it's true with pretty much all lithium batteries, self-contained and stable, um, no maintenance basically. It doesn't off gas, doesn't need you know, specific gravity checks, watering, anything like that. Um, it's pretty self-sustained and doesn't really require a lot of work. It also has a very low self-discharge rate. So the self-discharge rate is about 1% per month, and that's on the high end of things. So if you're not using the battery, it can hold the charge very well. This can be really helpful, what I've seen in battery backup situations, um, where you really want to hold that power until you need it, but you also don't want to be charging the battery constantly to have it hold that charge. All right. There we go. Uh, and my favorite kind of a bit of a ridiculous slide, but you know, if we're looking at, this is an actual replacement here. So we see lead acid batteries on the left, um, just kind of good to highlight, you know, look at the battery box, a lot of corrosion, probably a vent fan and um, a lot of maintenance required. And you can see how many batteries on the left, the new bank on the right actually has more power and more energy available in a smaller package, much more clean uh, and easy to work with. Oh, sorry there. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into some of the, some of the products. I do have a bit more of uh, some of our other products at the end. So if you don't see a product you're interested in um, that you, you might have seen, I'll probably go into it at the end. Okay. Our two main batteries, I would say these are our biggest sellers, is the 2.9 and the 3.8. These are just our basic battery blocks. Um, come in 24 volt or 48 volt. We originally designed them as kind of an easy drop in lead acid replacement, but now you know we're using them for all sorts of projects. They each come with their integrated battery management system um, and even an integrated circuit breaker, which really can help on installation as you can make the batteries basically not live while you're working with them. These products are really the cornerstone of everything we do. Uh, and really we build out other products using these similar, um, mostly using these batteries specifically. Um, so an example of that, our access unit, basically an all-in-one unit. Don't worry about the access too much right now. I'm gonna go into it in a lot better detail here at the end. But basically it's our, our all-in-one solution, DC or AC coupled, NEMA 3R, outdoor rated, uh, pre-wired, pre-programmed system. We have these little Jennies and big Jennies as well. Uh, these are kind of just portable power packs. Um, you know, tons of different applications here. Portable power, emergency power, still using lithium iron phosphate chemistry um, and still the same manufacturing process. So uh, they hold up really well. Uh, these are waterproof cases. Um, and, and these are available pretty readily. You can even get solar panels added on and different things like that. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, you know, even whether you're a salesperson, whether you're an installer, uh, designer, whatever it is, I think it's important that, you know, most in this industry, a lot of people play the coin of, of sales as well, even when you are an installer. So I like to just kind of do a little brief 
sales uh, section here, talking really about the cost of the battery and how to analyze that properly. So levelized cost of energy is typically where we lead people. Uh, levelized cost of energy, as I always see it, is basically an ROI related specifically to energy storage in this case. And how do we level out that, that cost? How do we look beyond the upfront cost and see how much a, a kilowatt hour of each battery cost over its lifetime? Now, the equation we use for that is the cost of the battery over the capacity of the battery, the cycle's warranty, which is a bit tricky now with the, typically we just use 10,000, I believe, that's kind of the high mark, um, times the efficiency. You can also use throughput where cycles is, just so you know, and times the depth of discharge used. So basically what this does, you can, oh, excuse me, you can also add an ancillary cost. If you are the installer, especially, you might know, you know, one battery costs more to ship, one battery might require pallet jacks, things like that. Um, so it's important to kind of look into those costs as well. Don't worry too much about this. Don't feel like you need to write it down or anything. Um, I'm not going to click the link here because it never seems to work super well, but we actually have uh, the link itself from my PowerPoint. The calculator itself works great. Uh, we actually have an LCOE calculator live on the website. It'll do all this math for you. You can type in different products, different costs, um, and get some, some really good numbers here to compare. Just an example, you know, here's, here's an older, this is even an older 3.5 model battery, higher cost at the time even. Um, and you can see here we use 90% depth of discharge in this example. So 5,000 cycles based on the old warranty. Basically, we got a cost of 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, this competitor that we compared to at the time had a lower upfront cost and actually came out higher as far as the overall cost of ownership of the battery. Our cost has come down up front lately um, and, and continues to, so the good news is this, is this gap's growing even greater. Okay, if you do need sales tool, again, Levelized Cost of Energy tool is live on the website. Um, it's a super helpful tool when it comes to, to kind of giving proposals and things like that as well as if you do need proposal tools, we, we have some good resources there as well. All right, let's go into battery sizing. So let's just talk briefly, just FYI, if you are in this kind of a near installer, this, this presentation is really the basic presentation. So we just go into battery sizing and a little bit about installation, but if you are interested in kind of a more in-depth look at installation. I've got tons of advanced webinars coming up um, that'll be live on the website soon, and those go really deep into um, basic or, or more advanced techniques. I even have a workshop coming up very soon that um, will be three days worth of a battery design to installation to programming. Okay, so again, the, don't worry about the warranty here. So it's unlimited cycles, but you still kind of want to consider your depth of discharge. You know, depth of discharge can really prolong the battery life. So it depends on how you're using the battery to decide what you want to do as far as depth of discharge goes. Let's say a battery backup situation. You know, this is a really good opportunity to use more of the battery's capacity and lower depth of discharge. So maybe we want to use 90 or 100%. You know, in those situations, we're likely not cycling the battery every day, and we've got a little bit more leeway of using more capacity. On the other side of the coin, off-grid systems, you would likely want to use 80%. You want to maximize your customer's battery life and make sure that it's still working. They, they def definitely are going to be charging and discharging, most likely on a daily basis, and you really want to maximize that battery's capacity. So while you can use really anything um, I mean, you could use any lower depth of discharge with zero to 80, but between 80 and 100, just consider what your mode of operation is, how is the battery being used, and really it's a good way to base it and, and decide how much of that battery um, discharge you want to use. Probably one of our most important rules currently is consider that the battery should be sized to twice the inverter's output capability. This is super crucial. Um, inverters tend to not have 
any output limitation. I know of one right, or I guess two right now that can do this when in off grid mode. So it's important that, you know, if you've got an eight kilowatt inverter, like in this picture, use 16 kilowatt hours of battery minimum. You can always size larger than that, but that's really the minimum. And it fits right into that C over two limit, that max continuous discharge. If you undersize it, oftentimes, and, and from what I've seen in the field, uh, you know, a customer says, oh, I promise I'm only going to use 2,000 watts out of my 4,000 watt inverter, and then the battery isn't sized properly, and they use too much, too much power, and it can damage the battery. I won't bore you too much with this. Let's just kind of pop that open. So this is just a little example I do when sizing. If you are looking to replace a lead-acid battery, you, know, you might want to look into, you know, what does it take? You know your new battery, let's say in this case is the older 3.5 model, simplify battery, and you know you want to use 80% depth of discharge. So basically you just calculate out the usable capacity here. Take the current bank, let's say it was a 450 amp hour, 48 volt AGM. You know that it has 21,600 watt hours total, likely 50% depth of discharge, so about 10.8. Divide that number by your new battery's usable capacity, and you can see we came out in this specific example about 3.8 batteries to replace that 450 48 volt um, AGN. So about four batteries, you just round up there. I say don't worry too much about this, because actually that's one of our other calculators that are built into the website. Um, we have a battery sizing calculator, as well as a complete lead acid replacement guide that kind of goes into the nuances of, of what, what to look for when replacing a lead acid with our batteries. So again, if you need those kind of documents, uh, go into product documentation. You can get things like manual spec sheets and integration guides. But if you go under tools, you'll often find the cool, you know, the proposal tools, the um, sizing tools and, and various things like that. that can be really helpful when you're an installer or even on the sales side of things. Okay, there it is again, I guess I didn't know it was there. Again, battery sizing tools. I don't know why the link's missing here, but we do have wiring, a wiring guide as well, um, and even can direct you towards engineering services if you need that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about installation. So shipping and receiving the battery, this is exactly what a battery would look like when it arrives to you. So, you know, if, you, if you're an installer or even distributor, it's important to check these batteries, check the box for damage right away. Um, you know, if, if for some reason it seems like maybe the box did see some damage, um, I, I just say typically don't sign for it. Um, you know, it, it might not be visible on the battery, but if there has been damage while shipping, you know, that's not something that we can really work with. That's something the shipping company has to do as far as filing a shipping claim. So even if it seems like there's no damage, but the, bat, the box might be damaged, I would typically recommend not signing for it and filing a shipping claim, or at least get the battery back to us for inspection um, before, before we install it. Once it's been installed, if there is shipping damage, there's not much we can really do. Also, never bad to check to make sure that whoever you bought the battery from sent you the right one, whether it's 24 or 48 volt. I say check the breaker there and that, that bullet. It's a, it's a good indicator if the battery's been dropped or not. So if for some reason it was dropped during shipping, and, and it has to drop pretty hard. These boxes are designed to absorb quite a bit. But if it's been dropped pretty hard and the breaker's not flipping on and off, uh, that might be a good sign that it is damaged. Not always though. Okay, let's talk about mounting and clearance. We have no clearance requirements, meaning these batteries can basically sit flush up against each other. Um, you know, if you're using bus bars or something like that, you might need some gaps in between, but as far as what we say, there's no need to have space in between them. If you're mounting these batteries, we actually have our own bracket design. Uh, you can see here in this picture that's specifically for mounting the batteries. However, not a requirement. If you have a different way of mounting or a custom rack, you can always use that. Battery box is fine. I've seen people use shelving units. Um, there's really not a lot of requirements 
when it comes to these batteries. I don't like them stacked. Uh, that's typically a no-go. Don't stack them on top of each other um, just because it can push down on them. I see a few people raising your hands. Um, again, just go ahead and type into that q and I can't unmute you during the presentation, but we'll, we'll get to all those questions here at the end. Okay, as far as orientation goes, the batteries can basically, and you might call me out here if you've seen the, if you pay attention to the last few slides, um, the only thing we don't recommend is these leads facing down. We've got some older pictures where that was the case. We used to allow for it, but um, we actually do not allow that anymore. So they can sit on their sides though, um, and, and basically any other orientation except for those those battery terminals facing down. Okay, parallel wiring. So I mentioned these batteries parallel only. Now, it is a bit different than you might be used to. So it, oftentimes if you're doing lead acid or even other batteries, you're used to jumping from positive. If you can follow my mouse here, you can see it basically positive to positive to positive to positive up to a connection point or a bus bar. We have our batteries wired a bit differently. We have same length, same size cables, each running separately to a common, whether that's a bus bar, inverter connection, battery combiner, whatever it may be. Same thing with the negatives. This allows the energy and the power to really uh, flow evenly, whether it's charging or discharging, and we really see a higher efficiency this way and no, no battery off balance. So this is a single line showing this a bit in more depth. Uh, in this case, you can see they're using two different battery combiners, running all these batteries into the combiner and then connecting to the inverter. Um, <clears throat> cool thing here is we can use smaller cable lengths. Uh, I think it's four gauge or I, I can't remember what the new battery is, but I believe it's still four gauge. We would recommend um, going from the battery to the combiner. And then you just need to sum up your batteries and maybe you're using a two odd or a four odd, but a smaller length to the inverter. So you can use all sorts of things to do this. You know, battery combiner boxes are great when it's a bigger installation. Um, you know, Midnight Outback make two really good ones. Um, you can use the power panels already supplied by the inverter company. So oftentimes, you know, if you're buying, let's say, a Schneider XW Plus and you buy a PDP panel with it, um, you would have the ability to land, I think, like three batteries on that panel already. So if it's a smaller installation, that might work. Uh, it's basically just you want to use basic DC copper bus bars. If it can handle the voltage and the amperage, um, you can always build out your own custom design within, within an insulated box, and we're okay with that as well. So really, it's just about combining the batteries, um, nothing, nothing too over the top. You can see here, this is an example where a customer actually used breakers um, and a surge protector here. Again, not a requirement. Of course, you can always add extra protection onto these, um, but but that's probably overkill. You can see here all these batteries are being combined and then there's two connection points uh, on the radians here in the GS load centers. So that's kind of an idea of how you might see it in real life um, using the combiner and then running to these inverters. Okay and torque specifications. Can't stress this enough um, you know, use these two specifications, either one, 160 inch pounds, 13.3 foot pounds. These are the torque specifications of the terminals. Uh, if you over torque the battery, you can cause damage to those terminals. If it feels like maybe it is spinning as you're doing it, just keep going until you get to that, that correct um, torque value and it will stop. So be careful. Make sure to calibrate your torque wrench. I've seen this so many times where an installer goes from one site to another without ever calibrating, recalibrating the torque wrench, and they snap off a lead. But they, you know, they call me and they say, hey, I went to 13.3, it snapped. And then uh, we find out later that if they haven't calibrated the torque wrench in, you know, a year or something. So be careful. Use a proper torque wrench. Don't use an impact or anything like that. Okay, when it comes to system commissioning, um, so you can see on the right here, this is actually a little bit out of our Schneider integration guide. We've got tons of different integration guides on the website with various products. Um, basically, we're taking the exact language that that 
inverter or charger manufacturer uses, and we're telling you exactly what the setting is. So don't worry too much about, you know, what you don't have to memorize by any means what the bulk, what the absorb, what the float, low battery cutout all are. Just go ahead and pull these integration guides. You know, we've got like Outback, Schneider, um, Magnum, Victron, Morningstar, um, tons of different ones on that website. So just peek around. If for some reason we don't have one that you want to integrate with, just shoot us an email. We'll make sure that we can either, uh, first of all, check for compatibility, but also just ensure that, um, you know, all the settings we can type in are correct. So you can always look through the basic manual, but these integration guides are always key when it comes to setting up a system as they really just take all the guess and check work out of it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about installation and code requirements. As far as NEC codes go, you know, batteries are still kind of a, I hate to say gray area, but you know, there's certain things that are called out and certain things that are not called out. Uh, one of those, the biggest I'd say is rapid shutdown, how it relates to batteries. Rapid shutdown more relates to battery systems, I'd say. Currently, you still don't need a rapid shutdown um, breaker, a remote trip breaker on your battery itself. I think this will likely change pretty soon. But as far as rapid shutdown goes, it mostly just refers to the solar array still. So you can use all sorts of different options here if you're DC coupled, you know, birdhouse, shutdown, shutoff boxes. Oftentimes, it's an off-grid system. You might just require a shutoff box at the entrance of the home if it's a uh, ground mounted system. Um, and then, of course, if you are using DC coupled, uh, super easy to add panel level shutdown. You can always use these, these little shutoff boxes, like Tygo makes a good one. Uh, it's basically just a unit that clips onto the panels and then renders that DC coupled system rapid shutdown compliant on a modular level. AC coupling, you know, as far as code requirement go and battery based systems, if you're AC coupling, you're probably already uh, rapid shutdown compliant. Adding in a battery system doesn't change that at all. So here you can see our access unit, which is often used AC coupled. If you add in the access, it really doesn't make it, uh, it doesn't change that rapid shutdown compliance. Okay, so speaking of the access, let's talk a little bit about the access unit. So this is our all-in-one unit, um, industry-leading inverter inside. We have two different options right now. Um, this could be for new or existing PV or even a, um, you know, existing PV I see a lot of them are AC coupling. You can always use these for DC coupled as well. Uh, they're NEMA 3R, so they're ready to sit outside. A bit of variance as far as sizing goes, and they are both Rule 21 compliant for anyone in California pre-wired, pre-programmed, um, and they can even support things like generators on them. So this is the first access unit we ever created, and we still use this one. Um, this is with the Schneider components, currently with the XW Pro. Uh, this unit comes AC coupled standard, and if you want to go DC coupled, you can add the larger 600 volt charge controller you see on the right there uh, as an added option. But out of the box, it is uh, AC coupled ready. We also have the Solark. This is our newest access edition. Uh, comes in 8KW and 12KW inverter models. Uh, this one is AC or DC coupled, no matter which you order. It actually has the MPPT built into the inverter. So whether you order, no matter how you order this, you have both options. This one can have a lot more batteries, obviously. I mean, you could have a lot more batteries on either one, but this one comes standard with a lot more batteries. A little side note, we don't parallel these units. However, if you do need more battery storage, we do sell these cabinets blank, or uh, basically empty, uh, with bigger shelves on them. So you can always add more battery storage uh, to one of these access units. We just don't parallel the entire unit. So again, AC coupled or DC coupled, you can even add generators to these systems. If it's the Schneider unit, make sure you add the S or AGS, automatic generator start function. And the good news here is no matter which unit you go with, 
or however it's connected, the automatic transfer switch is already built into the system, meaning you have your sub panel, and when the grid goes down, these units will automatically disconnect from the grid and power whatever is on your sub panel until the grid is back up. That's an, built into the system already, so there's no need to add any external ATS. As far as post installation goes, we just rely on what Schneider and Solark already have built in as far as monitoring goes. So this is just, you know, their monitoring platform here, real time data, historical data as well. So you can see what's going on in real time. And you can also change how you want to see your historical data and which could be really helpful for troubleshooting or just maybe adjusting loads, things like that. You get this on your laptop, you know, your cell phone. Uh, your tablet, whatever it may be. Solark, same, very, very similar feel. Most of these are, again, real-time, historical monitoring, um, and, and just seeing what's going on in the system. Really customer-friendly uh, so that they can monitor what's happening on their access unit. The Express unit, um, this one's a smaller version. I don't even want to say it's a smart version of the Access. It's a lot different than the Access, but it's basically about half the size. It's actually still NEMA 3R rated. It's on wheels, so it is mobile. Um, and this one's a bit different. You can hardwire in. You'll see here that we're using the Magnum. Uh, it's actually uses a Magnum Energy um, inverter and currently a Morningstar charge controller. These are both able to be hardwired, so you can wire PV directly into this into the charge controller and wire the Magnum directly into um, a loads panel. However, they were designed for also quick, easy connections. Pretty customer friendly stuff. So we have an AC inlet built directly into this. Think like shore power, like if you were uh, you know, using an RV. You can pull directly from the grid, plug the unit in and start charging from that AC inlet. We have a DC quick connect inlet as well. This is basically a, an inlet that you can plug PV panels into the unit for charging and then quickly disconnect them without any issues. Like it's not an MC4, it's actually a different kind of connection. So it doesn't, you can actually quickly disconnect and connect it back in. Um, it has four outlets on the side. So you can plug loads directly into this unit. It also has two USB ports for charging things like tablets and cell phones or whatever, you know, whatever you have that might be USB compatible. Um, so, tons of applications here. I mean, off-grid, on-grid, emergency power, apartments. The cool thing with this unit is, you know, it can sit in the garage. You can charge up directly from the grid. It doesn't need to be at all wired into your loads panel in the home. Power goes out. You know, low self-discharge rate means those batteries are nice and charged up when, you, when you're done or when you need them. Roll the thing into the house and start plugging loads directly into the unit. So that's really what this is for, uh, as well as kind of mobile and emergency power as well, things like that. So you can hardwire it, but it is designed just to be able to be used uh, directly from these various ports. You might just need to do a little load calculation, style, you know, make sure, hey, is this going to work with what I'm using? But it can cover some pretty large things. It can even cover things like a window AC, 6,000 BTU. Um, so we can cover some pretty heavy loads, but just make sure you're kind of figuring out, you know, what's the runtime realistically without a charge and, and really going through that. Okay, we're doing really well in time here, which is great. Uh, this is actually my last section here, and we've got a ton of questions I see, so we'll try to get through this. Um, high voltage solution. This is our newest addition to the product line. Um, actually comes in two different nominal voltages, the 24 volt and the 48 volt. These are just the building blocks. So I've said a few times throughout the presentation, parallel connection only. This is the only exception on our product line. These batteries are series connections. So you can build up in voltage. So you can build up between 200 and 800 VDC nominal. And then from there, we can stack up to about two megawatt hours of storage. So these are for things like microgrids and large scale backup. Really the way to determine if you should go with low voltage or high voltage is your AC requirement. So if you need a battery that can do 480 volt three phase, or I should say the inverter does 480 volt three phase, 
this would be something that you'd want to pair with that inverter. This doesn't come with an inverter, it's just the battery and the external BMS. So we are inverter agnostic as far as what, what we can use on the high voltage product. The battery management system, as I just said, is actually external, unlike our, our standard batteries. It's CAN bus, Modbus, and Ethernet ready. It is a Nuvation BMS currently. So this is um, the external stack controller here. And then you can see the uh, various points where we're connecting to the battery externally through the BMS. Uh, just a quick note before I get to the Q&A here, this product is also able to be containerized um, and shipped on site. So you can actually build out how you want um, the battery to look and get it shipped on site. All right, so I am gonna go ahead and open the Q&A. There's a lot of questions. So I will do my best to try to get through all of them. If you do have a question right now, uh, go ahead and type it into that uh, Q&A. And one more time, if you need NAPSEP or CEUs for this presentation, please go ahead and type it into training at simplifiedpower.com um, or just, just shoot me an email there and say, hey, I need credits. Make sure your name's on the email somewhere so that I know what to put in the, uh, the certificate. I see a few hands raised again. Again, just type in that Q&A. Don't, don't raise your hand or else uh, I won't be able to get to your question. Okay, we sent out the slides later. Yep, we'll be sending out a follow-up with the slides in the presentation. I'm not sure what this question means. It says, can we get a plain uh, certific certificate, even if it's not identified with a specific credentialing organization? Not really sure. Maybe if you wanna uh, elaborate that, I'll see if, if we can get to that at the end. Okay, let me just put everyone's hands down again. Please just type in the Q&A there. I see a few hands. Or a second here, everybody because then I have to go and actually lower your hand before I can move on. Okay, so I'm interested mainly in small systems, three to six kilowatts solar systems with backup for home. I'd like it portable if possible. I'd love to work with the Simplify in some way going forward to the market. PS just hoping that Tesla decides to expand to this area. Well, I don't know about the Tesla stuff, but um, yeah, no, shoot us an email. We're, we're happy to help. That's definitely something that we, we can help work with um, and really uh, help out there in that, that kind of three to six kilowatt hour range easily. So um, there's some resources on our website. If you are looking for sales information, um, you can get one of our sales application engineers pretty easily, either by calling or just shooting a contact form through. Okay, temp and humidity, I already went over temp. So again, uh, zero to 49C as far as charging, operating uh, is a little bit wider. Um, negative, I only know in Fahrenheit, sorry. Negative four to 140. Uh, I might have just said that wrong. Um, check out the spec sheet though, it has it. As far as humidity goes, I don't, you know, we don't have super big information regarding that testing wise. I will say I've seen plenty of batteries in very humid locations work just fine. I think my kind of general rule of thumb is, is there water that's actually building up around the battery and then it's in a too humid of an environment to work. No external BMS necessary. Nope, no external BMS currently except for the high voltage. Uh, we do have some third party um, products that we can offer. If you do need that external communication between the inverter and the battery management system through Gila is the company we pair with, uh, but you do need to order those batteries special. What battery brands use other chemistries? Uh, most of them, <laughs> Tesla, LG, those are all the big ones as far as cobalt-based chemistry. Um, you know, things like Sonin, Discover, Us, uh, tons of other ones are using lithium iron phosphate, but there's probably still more cobalt-based out there. When will we get greener, more eco-friendly smartphone batteries that last for a week without charging? Uh, you have to ask your cell phone provider that one. I, we don't work with uh, cell phones or anything that small. I'm gonna 
just jump over a few of these that are uh, kind of more general battery questions, not really related to uh, our products. Can newer batteries and older batteries be mixed? Yep, again, you can expand on that battery bank later on. For residential, can I install a battery bank without solar? Absolutely, um, definitely an application. I've seen you know, putting in a battery bank with an inverter just for backup purposes only. The express unit that I showed you is actually a really good product uh, for that, where you don't even need to hardwire anything in. Uh, can older gas heated buildings ever be retrofitted for solar? Uh, probably, uh, you know, you go hot water solar. I don't know, probably not the best person to ask on that one. Uh, see some customers asking about, yeah, F, uh, some flooded lead acid replacements and L16s. Absolutely, get in contact with us or use our uh, battery bank sizer. Uh, or lead acid replacement tools, and you can you can size out a battery bank for them. Um, but that's definitely one of the biggest things we use our batteries for is replacing. Definitely get in touch with us if it's really old equipment, uh, just so we can confirm it all works. Why can't we install them in series? So the standard batteries BMS is actually not designed to go into series, so you, you would damage the BMS. When to choose 48 over 24? Uh, if you're starting from scratch, I typically say go 48 volt. Uh, it has a higher power output, um, as well as the equipment tends to be a, a bit, makes a bit more sense. Uh, if you're AC coupling, absolutely go 48 volt. Uh, but 24 volt, you know, it's great for if the system's already in place, lead acid replacement, you can always replace with 24 volt. Uh, I see a question about radio charging or remote charging batteries. Um, basically like induction charging, it sounds like is what you're asking. Uh, nothing to do with our batteries currently. Um, I think that's probably more on the cell phone side still. Uh, prices and availability across the range, please um, get, go ahead and get in touch with either us or if you go to our where to buy page, we sell strictly through distribution partners. So you'll see uh, various distribution partners pop up there that have pricing available. Uh, either on their website or you can always get in contact with them. Typically what you see on the website is a bit more expensive than they actually offer. Uh, okay, so question about LFP batteries and, and our batteries specifically with their own BMS, would they be compatible with older lead acid chargers? Well, older charge controllers. Yeah, typically, I mean, I've come across <laughs> very few charge controllers that don't work. If it's really old or like a PWM or like a C40, you know, just shoot us an email. We'll make sure everything's okay. But uh, typically, yes, they will pair even with the older charge controllers. Can you use the battery bank to charge EVs? Absolutely. I mean, you definitely want to size it correctly, make sure you're following, you know, how much power do you need and how much energy storage do you need? But yeah, you can definitely charge EVs. Seen it plenty of times or even EV charging stations that use our batteries. Do you have any distributors in Indonesia? Huh? I'm actually not 100% on that. So shoot us an email on our sales line or shoot back to me on that, um, that blast email that goes out and I'll, and I'll make sure to get you in touch with somebody on that side of things. Okay, I see a few questions. I'm just gonna try to get through these. I'm not sure exactly what this means. Says, can you build higher voltage batteries on request? I'm guessing this came before I went through the high voltage stuff, but we do have most products in stock and available. Uh, can you stack access units? Uh, no, so no, no stacking the access unit. Uh, if you do need to stack inverters, just do it without the access unit. It's just too much work when it comes to the access. Um, and it just isn't really designed for that. Uh, does your inverter integrate report LFP cell voltages? So the current BMS does not do that other than internally, but uh, the newer BMS coming out soon will, will be able to do that. Or 
if you absolutely need that kind of uh, granularity, uh, you can look into the third party. Just just give us a call. And we'll we'll connect you with uh, how to get these third party products that we use to act as an external BMS. I like this question. Is there a point to have an external BMS? Yeah, I don't, I don't, sometimes I don't really think so. I mean, you know, it's costlier and it adds a little cost to the battery. Um, it is super, it's helpful when you're downloading, basically like you could have a file that could dump the settings into the inverter uh, to make sure that it controls what, what the settings are, but definitely not. I, I would say there's not a huge benefit to having an external BMS, but there definitely are some benefits. Oh, good question. Do you have 12 volt batteries? Yes, we do. Uh, we only have one option for 12 volt. I believe it's a 1.4 currently a kilowatt kilowatt hour battery, but we do have 12 volt batteries. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, 3.5 batteries have a low voltage below seven volts. Um, you can have to email our tech support or, or shoot us a call on the tech line. Um, that sounds like a damaged battery. So it might be an over discharge or something like that, or a low, too low of a discharge. Um, but probably something I wouldn't want to dig into during the webinar. So go ahead and just give us a call on our tech, technical support. Off grid cottage use? Absolutely. Uh, marine vessels, that's a good question too. Yeah, that's not a problem. Um, I will say our batteries really shouldn't be used for the startup though. So like don't use them for a starter battery for your bat for your boat or things like that. Uh, but you can use it for the power side, the the you know what the household loads of that system. Uh, I see a few people putting their emails into this. Uh, just shoot me an email, please. It's just too hard for me to write them all down right now for the NAPSEP credits. So go ahead and shoot me an email at that training email and I'll I'll get you your naps up CEUs. When is the three day training session? I don't have the exact date. I believe it's it's definitely sometime in June. We're trying to get all these live today. So keep an eye out on that training page. I'm really trying to get that updated by the end of week at the latest. But um, we'll send out some emails to make sure everybody's aware of the updated schedules. Uh, why is the continuous discharge C rate C over two less than competitors one C? Um, I'm not sure which competitors you're looking at, but they might be talking about their maximum discharge. So as far as max discharge, which is not continuous, we actually support 60. So like our 3.8, for instance, can handle 60 amps DC for 10 minutes per battery. So that's well over C over one um, or C one, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we can definitely these batteries can handle a lot more than C over two. Um, as far as that 10 minute mark, that's just our continuous discharge and charge. Now we do have high output batteries special available. So again, they're really not necessary for anything residential or really most use cases don't need that much power output. But if you do need a battery that can handle I believe it's a little greater than C over one um, continuous. We do have a, a special high output battery available. As far as the high voltage batteries, which inverters do you support? Um, yeah, it's right now I think the main one we've been working with is DynaPower. Um, but if you have an inverter you like working with, just shoot us an email and we can work with you on the project to make sure it works. Uh, where can I sign up for the Simplify Installer Certification Program? Go to the website, and it's actually under Training, and you'll see Installer Qualification uh, Application. Just fill out the application, I'll get back to you with, with more information of what's required and, and as well as the tests and whatnot. Does the SolArc Access have a low temp charging shutoff? I do not believe so. Let me double check on that, but um, I don't think it does. Most most inverters don't. You could always add in an external to the 12 volt relay though. 
Uh, okay, so good question. If you're using the battery at like C over five, will that make the battery last longer? Uh, most likely. I think it's like C over two, it definitely can handle, but yeah, the, the less stress you put on the battery, most likely the longer it will last. So does higher ambient temperature affect the battery's cycle life? I would say so. It doesn't really affect the efficiency of the battery, but definitely if you're at that higher end of things, I, I, I would expect. It's definitely going to make it to the warranty period as long as you're within those temperature guidelines, but you could uh, definitely see less, less life beyond that if you're using an extremely high or low temperature. Uh, I just saw, yeah, uh, Jim, you're correct. Uh, let me go ahead and just update that. So, Jim, thanks for pointing that out. I'm missing a, a PA. There we go. There we go, everybody. That is the actual. <laughs> Apologies there. It looks like I, I messed that one up. But that is the actual uh, email address right there. Okay, uh, we're, we're right there at the two two mark, two minute mark here. So let me just try to get through a few more questions. Um, okay, so the question earlier about the certificate, you need a certificate not related to NAPSEP. Um, yeah, just shoot me an email if you need something just specifically like that, that's no problem. Are you shipping to Canada? Yep, we actually distribute through Canada as well. Um, I won't try to name everybody. I think HES is a big one. Um, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have mentioned anybody because I can't remember everyone's name. But there's there's tons of different distributors in Canada. Take a look at the website where to buy, and you'll see uh, various distributors we use up there. Um, okay, again, I see this tech support issue coming up with the two batteries. Yeah, that's that's your issue right there, most likely. You're not following the, the guidelines on the CO2 rate. So, uh, most likely the batteries, yeah, with an 8,000 watt inverter, I see, yeah, that's that's undersized. You probably have an over-discharge vent there. Um, you really got to follow those guidelines on the sizing requirements and the warranty and installation manual. Um, that's just for everybody, you know, it is, while sometimes it'll work for a month, two months, uh, if there is an over-discharge event, uh, it, can, it can really do some damage to that battery that's out of warranty. Okay, looks like we are just kind of at the end here. So I'm uh, I'm going to go ahead and just end it now. I apologize if I didn't get to your question. Go ahead and feel free to shoot any questions I did not get to to that email address. Or again, we'll send out the slides. We'll send out the presentation. Um, and always feel free to respond back with projects you're working on or just general inquiries. Um, and email me for those NAPSEP CEUs. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, so much for participating. And uh, keep an eye on our website for some more trainings coming up. Thank you.